Enough of that. Just improvise that. Here we go. This is paint with Alex. I'm Alex. Welcome to the show, folks. Here, I'll step back in camera. There's a little uh, painting I worked on last week that's, that was done. That's standing on the corner of Maple and Fifth in downtown, looking towards downtown. That's its work in progress. This piece, I, um, I started it with acrylic, and then I came back the next day because it was dry really fast and, and uh, gave it a second sitting working in oil. There's a shot of me out there. I gave my phone to someone who was a fan passing by. And um, so they took that cool picture. Look, at there's me smiling. Hey, I'm painting on location. There's a good shot of kind of how the, the piece is at the moment. Um, yeah, having fun with that. Really enjoying working with the acrylic and working wet over dry, which is a concept that we're going to talk a little bit about today. And uh, the theme of the main theme of the show is going to be local color and the evolution of form. Um, but right now, let's just uh, we'll go a few slides back here. Let's just we'll leave it on this nice shot of the downtown scene. And. Something's going there. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about a few other things that, that um, before we jump into our pictorial idea of the day. The um, one thing you might be noticing, if you're playing along, if you're playing along, um, the, uh, the paintings that you're working on, let's say like you got your kitty cat painting here. I can't remember if I brought this up last week. But uh, there, there's one cat painting that, that I did. I did a few of these and we're going to revisit this cat to explore a different concept later. But right now, all I wanted to say quickly was that um, I don't think I brought it in last week, but this stuff is something that is going to help with the, uh, the issue that we're, I don't know what camera it's on. Um, but this is kind of matte. It dries matte, which is sort of nice, but the problem is it dries matte some places and shiny in other, and that's a little bit of a problem sometimes when you want to go back in and paint on the painting, having two shininess levels. So this stuff that they make, different brands make it. You want to get what's called retouch varnish. It comes in a can or a spray. Temporarily restores gloss of, uh, um, to dry paintings, to dry oil paintings. So you just shake this up for a minute and pssst, spray it on, just literally like pssst, that's it. And, uh, and it's all ready to go. And then it won't have that kind of multiple, multiple layer levels of, of shiny and matte. Um, don't worry about it too much when you're painting um, the shiny matte thing because ultimately at the end of the piece you can give it a, a final coat of varnish and uh, oh look at my tie yeah, yeah by the way guys i just learned something about the tie it's a green screen tie uh, unfortunately so it's kind of you can kind of see through it eh, we're having fun with that one um so retouch varnish something to uh to uh, use and have in your arsenal of tools in your in your home studio when you're working with oil paint and for some reason lately I don't know the again the 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 paints are drying kind of more matte than usual I don't know if it's some pigment they're adding to it or if they're just cutting in the product with wax or something um, but it's kind of weird but I've noticed that now another thing that you might be at a certain point with on a painting that you might be working on and we got this this piece right here that is uh, Washington across the Delaware it's okay if we get a little glare on it I'm not going to be concerned about it and uh, and this is dry now okay we worked on this two weeks ago was it and uh, so and it was raw umber and titanium white and it is dry now uh, pretty much completely dry. I mean, I can all, even these thick areas with lots of white, uh, dry. So, now, when you're going to work another time on a painting, okay, that's what's called working wet over dry. 
Whenever you start a painting, you're pretty much working wet into wet the whole time because you're, uh, I mean, if you're, especially if you're oil painting, it, you know, it's going to take at least a day or two for the colors to dry. So everything's wet and there's certain things that are easier to do when it's wet, all wet, and there's certain things that are easier to do when it's dry. Now, one thing you might want when you go in and start to paint on your piece again is you want a kind of a flatness. It's got impasto. There's a lot of uh, texture and brush strokes. Now, there's a number of ways that we can impart flatness to the surface so that we don't have all these little impasto bumps to paint over. Um, the first way is to control it through the paint and the brushes. So you have very long paint, which uh, long means runny, as opposed to short, which means uh, kind of thick and uh, like butter, you know, or sour cream, or no, not sour cream, more like uh, cream cheese. It, um, so, or, uh, so then, you know, long paint, smooth brushes, a smooth canvas, and you apply the paint very flatly, and it dries, and it's flat. Now, another thing you can do is you could paint the whole painting wet into wet, and you could scrape it down. All right, now, what I like to do is I really believe in the beauty and the energy of a brush stroke, okay? I like that. And in fact, I find brush strokes to be sometimes more, more exciting in and of themselves than the, than the depiction of a well-turned form. Um, so I trust, I have trusted as I have matured as an artist more and more, trusted in the brush stroke and to leave it, okay, to fuss as little as possible with the brush stroke. Try to get it on there and let it be. But I've also found that when I want to work another time on the painting, that I might be troubled by some of the texture that has built up from the brush strokes. So now I've let this painting dry. There's another point when you could uh, go for smooth, and that's when you would take, let's say, a fan brush. And with all the wet paint, wherever there was a glob or a ridge of paint, you would come in with the fan brush and just kind of go whiff and whiff it away wet, just uh, wherever you saw too much of an offending blob of paint, you take your fan brush and just whiff, 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 whiff. Uh, and I, I can do that. You know, there's stories like Renoir that he would, like there would be a moment of paint that was so delicate that the only way that he smoothed it out was to lick the impasto off of the canvas with his tongue, that being the only tool deft enough to uh, smooth out that paint. So there you go, he's licking his paintings. I love it. Renoir. Uh, overall, not a big fan of Renoir, but he's got some great stuff that I'm a big fan of. So now what I like to do, okay, because, you know, I, I'm talking about multiple ways, and there's a zillion, gazillion ways to skin a cat. Um, but what I like to do is I take, I take this palette knife here. Yeah, there's, there's that focus thing. And um, this palette knife is sharp. I could cut you, I could cut, just slice like a razor with this because I used it so much. And I curve it like this and I use it kind of like a carpentry tool if you've ever heard like a rasper or a scraper. And so I'll come up to my painting and now it's at this deliciously dry stage, man. Okay, because the paint goes through kind of a few stages. It's gone past the stage where it makes a skin. That's the first thing that happens. It makes a skin and it's like a pudding top. And then underneath that skin, it's wet still, okay? Like pudding that's cooling off. But now it's dried a little bit longer and it's at the consistency of like clay. There's no really wet anymore, but you can still take your thumb and dent it. You know, I could push my thumb into this blob here and, and make a dent. Uh, but it's kind of solid all the way through. It doesn't have a skin anymore. And boy, that is the perfect time to shave it. Shave that sucker. So I'll just come up here and I just whoop, slice it. And you can see, I just sliced off all these nice uh, uh, globs of paint. And uh, I, can I can really can get into this. You can, I mean, I could just slowly 
slowly and carefully scrape down all the impasto, all the impasto, uh, without sand, uh, I mean, I could sand it as well at this point with maybe a sanding block or something, but I'll run my hand over it and wherever I'll find a ridge that I don't like, uh, then I'll just come right in and zoop, and you can see it just shaved it off like a string, that little glob of impasto. Now you can imagine when this was wet, that yes, I could have taken my thumb and smeared that glob out, or I could have taken a fan brush and done it. But I tell you, when, you, when the brush strokes that have such a liquid quality to it, paint is liquid, when the brush strokes which are in applied liquid are left to kind of freeze in that state, um, there's, a, there's an energy to it. And you know, not everybody does it. A lot of people, they subvert the paint to the form and the paint never asserts itself. It's always the form. And that's an interesting trick that you, know, that you, you can play with um, between vacillating between abstract and, uh, a, and a very careful uh, uh, depiction of form, which is what we've been talking about in this show in the beginning of the show. I don't know how many episodes are going to be devoted to this sort of a backstory to get you guys up to speed and so getting understanding some of the language. Um, but that's, that's another thing that we can do. And I could spend, boy, I could spend the next 40 minutes with my back to you guys and just have a blast just scraping off all this stuff. And I would use my hand. I remember, I remember a teacher, it was either a teacher that told me or I read about, uh, in a book about Degas. You know, Degas was a big, he was kind of a, I don't know, he was very uptight about what, who he thought he was. He did not like the Impressionists. He didn't like being associated with the Impressionists. And um, he would considered himself very much a classicist. And he never painted plein air. And he did not, um, and at the end of his life, he really detested everything that Impressionism became. Because by 19, 14 or whatever, Impressionism was lame, you know. I, I mean, it sort of, it was not avant-garde like it was in the 1860s. And so Degas was like blind, right? And someone would bring him a painting. And the Impressionism, by that point, it just got so thick. It was like Manet times 20, you know. And Degas would just run his hand over the painting blind and be like, good paintings are smooth. Oh. So he felt all these bumps and he could just be like, oh, I can tell this sucks already because it's all just whatever. Um, but don't be like that about everything, you know. Uh, take it easy. Okay, where are we right now? Cleany, let's see. Uh, scraping a dry painting, retouch varnish, two things I wanted to talk about. Working wet over dry, which is what we're going to do. Um, just a quick analogy about the brush cleaner and the, and the importance of the brush cleaner. Uh, again, when you're arriving at colors, which we're going to do today, um, Think of the brush cleaner as like, if you don't clean the paint out of your brush now and then, it's like leaving the sustain pedal pushed and trying to play the piano. It just, everything will eventually just mush together. So it's not just something that you use at the end of, of the, when you're done painting. It's something you use all throughout the painting. Um, okay, so now the theme that we're gonna talk about today is if I go to the, let's see, no, we got the, got some, let's go back to the slides. I'm queuing it up right now, too. All right. Uh, local color and the evolution of form. That is a very important thing to have in your mind. Understanding local color. What the hell is local color? It's so funny. Like, I will teach a class or a workshop and you're talking to like artists, you know, and um, you ask them to a very simple to define it. You should know if you're painting, especially if you're representing life in some way, shape or form or objects or volume or whatever, um, you have to, you, you really should have a clear understanding of what local color is. 
and we're going to mix a bunch of local colors. And in the process, uh, we're going to show you how we think about getting to a color. Um, if I were to give you an assignment that would be a good way to practice and, and get better at at colors, because you got to become, you got to really familiarize yourself with these pigments. Um, I would probably say, wow, you could learn something and you would become more familiar with paint and that sort of thing, uh, and the pigments and what hue they are and how they interact together. If you printed out a color photograph and then you just painted paint, you covered up the photograph with paint, and, and your goal was just to try to, you know, kind of work area to area and mix colors and, and cover this photograph. And you would come to the understanding that kind of that's what painting is in a sense. Uh, but the, uh, the thing that we're going to do today is local color and, and uh, define it, all right? So what, what is it? The, uh, if you think about the evolution of uh, form and our understanding of form, if we go back to the slide and I click to the next one, I got this image of, uh, this is medieval, okay? And this is pre Renaissance. This is so, and, the, and again, the Renaissance is about the rebirth, renaissance of old ideas, I guess. But this is kind of like the Dark Ages. And so uh, they forgot about how light and shadow and chiaroscuro works, in a sense, I guess, because the, the Greeks apparently knew it, although we don't have a lot of examples of their work. But you can see here, there's not really a feeling of, of light, okay? There's form uh, in, in, in that you have contours, and then you kind of have like flat, large areas of color that are uh, defined with, with a strong contour, and then what I kind of call like a tattoo shading. You sort of darken as you get to the edge of the contour, you kind of get the color darker, and that creates a roundness, okay? I think we got like one more sample. Same thing here. There's sort of like dark red, dark blue, dark, you know, a skin tone. It, it, it's not like Rembrandt or Caravaggio right here. There's a feeling of volume, but it, the world doesn't really feel like this. It's, it's the depiction of the world. Um, and I believe that uh, in the beginning, like back in, the, in these guys' time, they would sort of be like, well, you draw an outline and then you simply kind of fill it in with the actual color of the thing. So if there's a face, then you put the color of skin where the face is. And if they're holding an apple and it's a red apple, then you paint apple red there. And um, there's not really a feeling like there's a light and a shadow side. It's mostly just putting the local color in the area of the contour, and, and that's it. But again, what is local color? Good question. I should put my gloves on right now. Hold on. We're getting down to business. Okay, producer, what time is it right now? It's uh, 7.18. 7.18. 19. No, 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 19. Um, we'll have some guests one of these days, and we're going to definitely do some portrait, some portrait stuff. Um, but local color is the color of the thing itself, independent of light. I mean, how did like Aristotle define that, you know, that there's objects in the world, there is the, there is the sense organ in our body, and then the medium between the sense organ and the material world is light, okay? And uh, so the, uh, the light, the object, the color of the object doesn't change, all right? The color of the light on the object may change, but most things are not chameleons, you know? Chameleons, yes, they change color. And in fact, because they do, we are fascinated by them. You know, uh, 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 octopi change color. 
And because of that, we're fascinated by them. You know, most things don't change color. They stay the color that they are, uh, unless it's like a TV screen or whatever. But then that's light. That's not, that, that's not the world of objects. Um, so all the objects in the world are related and locked in, in kind of a, uh, a, 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 a range of how light or dark they can physically be. Because we don't luminesce. Without light, you couldn't see anything. All right. Um, so let's say that what, well, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to mix a bunch of local colors. And I'm going to paint a, a, a giant me into this landscape right here. Uh, uh, this is Marcel's, Marcel Duchamp's um, isolation cabin. He's in isolation right now. And so we're going to paint a giant me out here. And we're going to mix these colors kind of how I think that the uh, sort of the medieval mind thought about things. And in the process, we're going to learn about local color. Now let me go to this next slide, this slide right here. This slide shows all, my, all of my colors. These are all the colors that I use. And so as you can see here, I'll step out of the frame. Um, these are all the colors that I have on my palette today. The, uh, with the maybe one or two that I would add to it, you know, do a screen grab right now or, or whatever. Uh, those, with those colors, I can mix every color that I could ever possibly want. And if we go to the top-down camera right now, basically that is exactly what I've got laid out here. White, got cad yellow over here, yellow uh, ochre, got cad red light, permanent rose, ultramarine blue. Um, this is, we're working in color today. I know that we've been working in monochrome, but I'm explaining a new concept or at least getting an idea into your head about local color. So let's mix a local color, all right? And the first one we're going to mix is skin tone. We're going to mix a color that looks just like my arm, okay? So how do I do that? Well, there's three ways that we define a color, and those three ways are the hue, which is the, what color is it, the value, which is how light it is, and the saturation, which is how intense it is. So the first thing that I can know about my arm is how light it is. And uh, so I got a little grayscale here, and uh, you can see that uh, my arm is about, oh, it's about uh, right about there, OK? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just mix a few of my pigments that are pure out of the tube here to the value of my arm. I don't even know necessarily what exactly it's going to be, OK? But there's some burnt sienna and white. And I'm going to paint that on my arm here. And uh, that's a little dark, OK? So let's lighten it. Burnt sienna and white, pure, just a straight tint of burnt sienna and white. And then we're going to paint that on my arm. And that's, that's pretty much disappearing. That's pretty good. That's about the value of my arm. Essentially, what we're doing here, folks, is, ma is mixing makeup color. You know, this makeup is paint that is at skin tones. <laughs> now, does that look exactly like my arm color? No, it's a little too orange but it's close, OK? So do the same thing with like two other pigments. This is what I call triangulating the way to the color. You don't know what it's going to be, but you, got a, you have your range of pure pigments. So the first thing that you can get right is how light or dark it is. And that's the first thing you should do. And you should also, I guess, make an educated guess. Like if I'm going to try to mix my skin tone, I'm not going to need maybe a tint of phthalo blue uh, to get a realistic looking skin tone. So here's burnt sienna and white, and we got the value. Let's mix some yellow ochre and white. We're triangulating here. So uh, I've got some yellow ochre and white, and I mixed it just right next to that other pile. And it's just about the same value. Let's paint that on my arm. Looks about the right value, but way too yellow, OK? 
Now I've got two piles of paint, and they're close, but no cigar, but they're close, all right? And uh, so let's do a third color. There's always sort of a greenishness to skin tones, you know, even though, uh, you know, we're not Vulcan. Um, but let's, let's go over into some of this green that's already on my palette, and let's make a tint of it kind of right near these other colors, right here. We're mixing the actual local color of skin, of my skin. So you can see, oh yeah, that looks just like crazy, like way too green. It's probably, you can't even see it. It's just green screen, just disappears. It looks like a hole or something. But the great thing is, neither of these colors are exactly it, but we got three nice clean piles of tint, and we're going to find it somewhere in here. It's not there. It's not there. It's not there. It's somewhere, somewhere. You'll find it. But the great thing is when you triangulate your way towards trying to find these colors, yeah, a little bit there. That's about right. Okay, and then let's, uh, let's take that. We're going to put that on the canvas right here where my face would be. All right? Here's my face. And then uh, let's, uh, let's pretend like I got a, I'm pointing at the, at the cabin here. And then I'm also saying, no, 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 no. You stay there, buddy. And then we're going to, I'm taking this color that I mixed that's the color of my arm makeup right there. And, uh, and we're just going to, wherever I'm going to put arms and, uh, and my face, I'm just putting it on, on the canvas here. That's going to be me. And we're just going to do a goofy drawing. Doesn't even matter. But let's, let's wipe that off my arm. And then uh, let's, let's go, let's mix the color. Oh, now let's take this color and let's also, let's paint a little swatch of it right here. Here it is on white. Okay. Skin tone of me. Okay. Anybody else, this would not be the same skin tone. There it is on white. There it is on middle gray value. So on white, you can see it looks quite dark, but if you put it in a, a darker tonal context, it looks, it looks light. Okay. So the next color, I'm going to clean my brush right now. Oh, and then by the way, just to figure out where exactly on the gray scale it is, uh, my skin tone is eh, somewhere right around in between those two those two values, okay? Let's mix my shirt. My shirt, it's white, okay? Here, let's pull my shirt sleeve out here. But the thing is, look at this, guys. I bought a cheap shirt. And you'll notice that if I put white paint, is there like a closer camera? I think there is. If I put white paint right on this shirt, it looks like a spot. The shirt's not even pure white, you know? Can't see it because of the lighting. But that's an interesting, see? So even this white shirt, we're going to put a little bit of color in it, like a teeny tiny bit of gray, all right? But that, that I've just mixed here, I can paint that right on the shirt. I can paint that right on the shirt, and you don't even see it. it just disappears. I could cover up stains by just painting right on my clothes. So here we go. That is shirt, white shirt. Now we're gonna, we're gonna put that back over here. White shirt actually has some color in it, all right? Teeny bit. So we got a swatch right there. Can barely see it. Uh, we'll paint another one over here. Now here you can see it because we're painting it in a middle gray value context. So you can suddenly see, oh, wow, that looks like a big white patch. All right. Boom. And it's got so little color, you can just barely see that the white shows up on camera. Now, what's the next? Uh, oh, and then now uh, let's paint my shirt. I got a vest on, so I got a little collar here. And uh, we got this collar right here. And then let's just make a little triangle, kind of a shape. And, uh, and then we got a sleeve. Here's a sleeve. I'll paint a little sleeve right there. And then now uh, we got another sleeve. And the, the, these are my white sleeves here. 
And it's this sort of a, sort of a very, very light, cool gray. All right? And what we're doing is we're, we're painting a character just with the, the colors that it is, the actual, the actual colors. Um, now let's, uh, let's do this green tie. See, we get the green tie right there. It's very light green. Here, we'll, we'll pull this out real careful and we'll kind of flip it over to the back. Now, we're going to do the, kind of the same thing with the green tie that we did with the skin tones, but maybe we don't need quite as many colors. Uh, but we're going to triangulate. So the first thing I'm going to tint up is some thalo turquoise. And I'm going to just mix a pure tint of that thalo turquoise and white until I feel like I get the value right. We can test it right here on the tie. Pretty good. Um, the tie has a little bit of a silk luster to it. Um, but in its half tone right there, they got the value, okay? We got the value, but we didn't get the hue because the turquoise is a little too blue. So right next to that pile of turquoise, I'm going to mix a pile of white and thalo green. Not thalo turquoise, thalo green. And we're going to match the same value because we got the value right. And now we're going for the hue. And I believe that somewhere in between these two, that looks pretty good. That's kind of just disappearing right on there. That is the color of my green tie. All right, we'll wipe that off. Oh, why do I buy new clothes? But this is a fun little, uh, fun little thing we're doing here. Okay, so that's green tie right there. Somewhere kind of in between my tint of Thalo green and my tint of thalo turquoise to the ascribed value. What value is it, by the way? Um, we're pretty much, we're kind of way up at the top now. We're like right around, almost up at the top of the value scale. You probably just barely see it in the lighting in here. Doesn't matter. So now let's, uh, let's put my tie on here. We're going to put that tie right there in my shirt. And that's kind of feels about right because the tie is almost like disappears on the shirt. You know, it's, it's because, especially because of that silkness, it kind of vanishes. And uh, so there's my tie. Bravo. Let's paint a little swatch of that over here. And uh, we didn't have to, uh, so, so now you've got, we're doing sort of like a little, oh here, let me bring this up back over here. This is tie. Yeah. It looks light against a middle value context. Back over here, it's going to look dark against white. Because, you know, everything looks dark against pure white. It's the way it is, you know. Uh, so we, got, we have mixed three local colors. How fun is that? Uh, I used to do this. I used to, I used to make uh, paint right on top of photographs, and I've seen people uh, really do an interesting, interesting work doing it that way. Um, so the next thing, my vest. Let's get the vest. The vest is gray, and it's pretty dark. If I, if I held up my, uh, my color, my value chart to my gray vest here, you'll see that it's, uh, it's right about, oh, I just got a spot on my shirt. It's over. Um, it's right about there, okay? So, Let's go ahead and mix that. Let's go ahead and mix that vest up, and uh, I mean, I might as well just paint on my. Uh, so we're back over here. We're going to triangulate now. I know for a fact that there's a million zillion awesome grays that happen between burnt umber and ultramarine blue, and so uh, I'm going to mix a pure tint of ultramarine blue to the value of uh, my vest, which is right there. And then back on the palette down here, uh, I, right next to it, I'm going to mix a tint of uh, burnt umber and white to that same dark value. So I got burnt umber tinted to a specific value right next to burnt, right next to ultramarine blue tinted to a specific value. And in between is where all those beautiful grays happen. So many beautiful grays in there. And, and look, I can, I can paint that on my, on my vest right now. I'm going to do laundry when I get home. Um, 
and it pretty much is vanishing. Maybe it needs to be a little bit darker, little bit darker. Yeah, right about there. Can't see it. Can't see it. Paint over. Yeah, I'm just going to paint over my stains. Okay, so again, what value did we get to? We got way down into that value, guys, way down towards the bottom. And we're going to paint that right over here. There's gray. That's my vest. Boom. There it is. There it is against a gray context. And there it is against a white context. Oh my gosh. Against a white context, it's almost starting to look like black. Like you would have a hard time with other colors removed from the circumstance telling exactly if that, that that was not black. All right. Now my pants. My pants are the same value as uh, are the, my pants are the same value as my vest. I'm doing a funny thing, and then they're there. And now I'm tired. <laughs> my pants are the same value as my vest, but they're warm, as opposed to my vest being cool. So if we go back over into our top-down palette cam, that pile of just straight burnt umber and, and white that I, that I mixed next to my ultramarine blue here to find the gray that was my vest, if I just same value, but lean more into the burnt umber, we're going to find that we are getting pants color. All right? So that's where that warm, cool, beautiful, warm, cool shifting happens between burnt umber and ultramarine blue. So, uh, and because we already had that tint, we maintain the same value, but we have a new, uh, a warmer, slightly warmer temperature. And I'm going to paint that right underneath here. And it's probably more obvious maybe on different cameras. And uh, so there it is in a gray context. There it is in a white context. Again, probably just looking like a black rectangle at this point. Um, so we got one, two, three, four, five local colors, actual colors. And I could just slather. I can slather this paint all over my body and just cover my vest dripping thick off of it. But be I've mixed the actual color of the things. And so we coat the surface. And uh, we, that's one thing that we do a lot with paint is we just paint it, we paint things with colors and, uh, and then they are a different color. But with paint, and as a painter, using paint the way that we end up using paint, uh, we have it do an extra trick. And <coughs> we're not really, <coughs> I think there's going to be, <coughs> excuse me, a part two to this episode. Because uh, we're still in the, we're still in the pre-Renaissance. We're still in the medieval thinking, okay? Uh, oh, but let, we got some, so we got a, how much time we got? We got 22 minutes left. So let's paint these, uh, let's paint my vest back over here. Uh, there's my vest, and you can see I'm cutting over those shapes. So here's the, the, and the sleeve, and there's my little vest right there. I'll paint it like that. And then we got the, uh, the other side here. And uh, uh, I guess it goes like that, yeah. I'm, I'm painting myself quite stocky, stocky gent. Um, and then uh, I'm going to clean my brush and I'm going to paint my pants, which are pretty much, like I said, same value, but almost like a straight tint of a burnt umber. So a pants, same value. And uh, so let's, uh, we're, we're walking, we're leaving the uh, Marcel Duchamp isolation cabin, and we're walking into the mountains to depict the beauty and the awesomeness of nature. You know, I'm applying for a, a two-week artist residency 
up in the mountains of Montana at this no electricity old thing. I'm really crossing my fingers that I get it. Um, now my hair, if I look at my hair, my hair is kind of like the same, um, I don't know, it looks like my pants. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to say that my hair is like the same color as my pants. And uh, so let's, uh, I want my, I want my face to lean a little slightly different direction. So we're going to, we're going to move my face a little bit. Yeah. And then we're going to uh, paint some hair. And there's some hair going down the side here. Oh, yeah. And then maybe we'll just make my beard a little bit red, redder. And uh, so the beard will kind of curve around and curve. And we got the other side. I like to think of my beard as an underline for my chin. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and then I have kind of like a white, a little white patch of hair right in the middle there. And my eyebrows are pretty much the same color as my, uh, my hair. So let's put an eyebrow in there, a couple of eyebrows. And I brought these red shoes in, but this is a no shoe zone somehow. So, uh, but I found these really, really cheap uh, red shoes. And so I'm going to give myself some red, red uh, uh, shoes. And the red, again, if we're mixing, since we're mixing actual local colors here, uh, the, the red, the value of the red is, hey, it's a little bit, little, it's a little bit lighter than, than uh, the grays and stuff. Red's a tricky color because um, you can really be deceived about the value of red because of the saturation of it somehow. And you'll think it's lighter than it is. Oh, look at that. Hey, I'm marching through the landscape. OK, so we're going to mix the actual color of these shoes right here. So uh, thinking, triangulating again. There's cad red light. And that's, uh, that's too light. If, if I paint that on there, you can see it's too light. Oh, yeah, we can just do it this way. Too, too light. So let's get some permanent rows and, and darken that a little bit with permanent rows. And so now we got the value right, but, it, but uh, that feels too, uh, too, too warm. So I'm right next to it, because we're triangulating here, uh, I'm going to mix another color that's the permanent rose. Um, and it's a cold red. It's a cooler color. And so but somewhere, I believe, in between these two, yeah, right about there. We got the exact color of these shoes. I could just paint this all over that shoe, and you wouldn't even see, because I mixed the color of the thing itself. All right? No illusion here, just surface colors. And the same palette that you can use to paint the illusion of light and shadow will also paint any kind of surface color you could possibly imagine. OK, so uh, here's a shoe. There, we're going to paint a red shoe. The tips are red. And uh, here's the other one right here. That's another shoe. Uh, and then let's go ahead and figure out, OK, well, the value of it is right about in between those two. Again, it's kind of around the same as all those uh, the gray pants and the, and the, and the shirt. And, uh, and so then let's just go ahead again and put that red in isolated context to learn about it. You know, uh, a lot of those Joseph Albers paintings that you see, like homage to the square, and you see them in museums, those were just exactly what I'm doing. They were classroom demos to explain how saturation works and to explain to students how, you know, um, whatever. And, but they're, they're masterpieces also, you know, of color and ex color exploration. So yes, they were painted in a classroom as a, uh, as a to visually and aurally explain concepts to students. Um, but they're works of art. I'm not saying what I'm doing is a work of art. Good God. Uh, but look at, look, we mixed six local colors. 
and I could be wearing, I could have a white suit on, I could wear all white suit, like a body suit, <clears throat> and I could paint all this, I could paint a vest on it, and I could paint the color, skin tone, color of my arms, and that white Snuggie would look like I had a vest and short sleeves and everything, you understand? Although very strange and weird and creepy at the same time. But we're living in a creepy age, so maybe, you know, the more that we can work on creeping, being creepy, I think the, the more that we're expressing the zeitgeist of our time. Okay, so then the last thing here is, is the, uh, there, there's like black on the, on, the, on the shoes. We got black on the shoes. And so I'm going to mix a black. And, you know, I've said it before, I'll say it again. My favorite way to make black, and everybody's got a million ways to make black, is my, I like burnt umber ultramarine blue. I find that that is a great way to make all kinds of different blacks. Warm blacks, cool blacks, uh, brown blacks, blue blacks. And, and, and we want variety. Again, interesting differences, interesting differences. And so I just mixed black here. And I, I, you know, I don't even need to put that on the chart. But we'll, we'll put some black down the side of the sneaker. And the, black, the tongue of the sneaker is black. And then uh, the back of the sneaker is black. And then uh, there's kind of like a little toe, I guess. And then the last part is, is white. So, uh, and we've already mixed white. Although the white of the shoes might be slightly different. But, you know, come on. We've only got 10 minutes left. 13. OK, so a uh, shoe. There's the shoe. We're walking. And here's, here's the, other sh the other shoe. There's the front. And then it kind of goes like perspective on the side. Shoes are tricky, guys. I'm not going to lie. But there's, there's the shoes. And that's, that's me. Maybe the last thing I would do would be uh, uh, put some dots where that is. And then let's, let's just mix some slightly pinker skin tone. And we'll just put a little smile on my face. And my glasses are off in this painting. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm fond of painting outdoors without my glasses. Now, if this was kind of like how this, to me, is, is sort of a, a pre-Renaissance medieval thinking. You could, be, you could be incredibly sophisticated with this. You could have a gorgeous, gorgeously articulated contour. And, and you could, and, and, and with, with beautiful arabesques and curves and, and, and forms and shapes. And, uh, and then you could uh, simply fill it in with the colors of the objects itself, and it would be beautiful. And, and it would have its own, um, its own quality that, was, was, uh, that, that would have an aesthetic. Now, now, what I, the last thing that I would probably say that, that these guys would do is what I call tattoo modeling, okay? And, uh, and we're going to save these, these local colors that we mixed here, and we're going to explain a further concept of how you create two levels of this same visual chord that we've made. Um, and the two levels put together are what create the feeling of light and shadow. Uh, and that is beginning to explain to you what Van Gogh meant when he said painting is like algebra. That's what we're getting into right now. We're explaining to you so that you understand exactly what Vincent meant when he said painting is like algebra. We are pre-algebra right now. This is like adding and subtracting. This is uh, uh, th because there's not a, like you're not creating a, uh, a, a set and subset of, 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 of things where you have a, 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 a fixed set of local colors and you're creating a high and a low key of them. That's what creates the illusion. And it's a trick and it's an illusion. But what would happen next with the old school guys? And, and I got a, another little canvas here that I did pretty kind of the same painting, um, but it, is the, uh, it was the blue landscape as opposed to the, uh, the brown one. Is with tattoo modeling, what they would do is they would take a brush and whatever was the color of, let's say, the vest, here's the color of the vest, all right? They would add a little bit of black 
to that color, just add black to the actual color of it, and then they would darken the edge. They would outline the edge where they added black, a little bit of black, to the actual local color that they mixed, and they would use that to draw a line around the form, circumscribing the form, and then blend it maybe. You can blend this. I'm dry brush blending right now, where I've, I, I, the, the underpainting that I did this last night is dry, and I'm able to scumble by dragging the wet paint over the dry paint. I can, sort of like charcoal shading, um, I'm able to uh, create this sort of a tube. You see, this, my teacher, when I was a student, he called this Gothic modeling. And I think what he meant was medieval or pre-Renaissance. And, um, and it's a very simple, and we do it instinctively. You know, you look at the cave paintings of Lascaux, and they're doing that same kind of modeling where when you get to the edge of a form, you darken. So like with my face or my arm, here's the color that I mixed for the skin tone. I'm going to go over and get a little black, and I'm just going to get a little black in here on my brush, and I'm going to just slightly darken this right here. And then I could come in and I could draw this darker line here. I could define a shadow. You know, you read in uh, very early books about painting by guys like Sinino, Sinini, and uh, these monks wrote these books of, you know, how to for the next generation of illuminated manuscriptor and fresco guy. And they would, uh, they would have very d d descriptions like exactly what I'm saying, you know, of how to, uh, to, to get kind of a neato effect of, of roundness. And adding black to a local color to darken it was a, uh, a pretty go-to way of, of, uh, of creating um, primitive, well, not primitive, but a, a, a very uh, old-fashioned way um, of creating volume. Ooh, okay. See, and I, I could even get even darker. Like, I could really get dark on the edge of this vest here. And uh, we'll round it, and we'll round that, all right? And as long as I gradate it nicely, you could almost go to black on the edges of these forms. And as long as you get a smooth gradation transition from black to, uh, to, the, to the first color that you laid down, you'll see that it'll create even more of a feeling of, of roundness. Man, you definitely see this a lot with graffiti art, um, with uh, spray painting, spray paint art, you know? And look, at, look up like uh, images of, of medieval frescoes and, uh, and paintings from like the 1300s and the 1200s. And, and uh, so you can see how that jacket now starting to feel round and getting a little bit of a, I mean, is it coming through in the camera, I guess? Um, so local color and the evolution of form is, you know, pretty much what we, what we are taught, what, we, what we're touching on. And you can see how by uh, simply using what makes perfect sense and is completely logical, I'm sure, to the artists that were all part of our collective art history and development, um, that it makes sense to them. You know, yeah, you paint things the color that they are. 
and, and that really worked for a long time. And, uh, but then certain artists made quantum leaps and, uh, and um, the d d descriptions of antiquity of, uh, uh, to, the, to the artists and the scholars in the 13, 1400s, reading about how the ancient Greeks were able to create these paintings that were so illusionistic that they could fool man and nature alike. And uh, they were like, you're kidding me, you know? And uh, so that understanding the, of what could be coupled with artistic breakthroughs that happen by doing it. That is how you learn to paint more than anything. You can watch me and I'm giving you good things to get in your mind, but at the same time, you are gonna learn by mushing paint around and by using, I think we're on a slide right now, um, uh, and by using by, uh, by, by using the colors, frankly, have no fear. Uh, li like at each, each time that we get together, I'm gonna make sure to give you some kind of a uh, little reassurance. Like last week it was how to recycle the Gamsol. This week it's the retouch varnish. And we'll touch upon tools and, and, and whatnot. But uh, we're, I guess we're gonna, how much time is left? Four, oh, we got four minutes. Um, good heavens. Uh, let me see what, uh, we're going to win our drives for zip, 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 up, 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 up. Um, huh? Oh, no, no. The, uh, oh, we could, we could bring this up. You know, if, if you are following along, okay, then, uh, you remember that, that we've been painting our own sort of a eye keyboard here and that this was step one, right? We got white and we got black, the two extremes of lightness and darkness that a color can get. And then we have the first half tone, which is middle gray. And we use that, we use middle gray as a major dividing point between values for all sorts of things. Now the next thing that we did as we continue to progress on our eye keyboard here is uh, we've mixed two more half tones. We got, um, no, it's just, yeah, I guess, whatever. We're fighting glare and that sort of thing. But uh, we, we still have white and middle and black because those are always there and they're the same. But inserted, snuck in between. Maybe, maybe this is the best, do the top down. Snuck right in between right there is the, uh, the half tone between white and middle and the half tone between middle and black. So front camera, that's what it starts to look like. We're doing a series of, of divisions. It's a gorgeous abstract painting, John McLaughlin-esque. <laughs> um, and then what the, uh, the last thing that, that I could bring up, since we're just hemming and hawing for a minute, is, uh, is tools, quick tools. We're good. Palette knife, guys. One of these days, you'll invest in a good palette knife. All right? Um, this is the worst, just to show you the extreme. Here's the worst. It's a piece of plastic. God, this is like a joke. I mean, I break this just looking at it, but yet they sell. Um, this is, this is the shiz, okay? This is a broken one here, but this is a nice new one. Holbein, boy, it's like a, uh, it's like a, uh, a Japanese samurai sword or something. Wait, is the show over? Hey guys, see you later. Uh, we'll be back next week and we're going to break off some more knowledge. You're going to understand the Renaissance. We're going to explain to you it in one slide. See you later. It's over. What are you pointing at me like that? All right.